progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again return to the book of Judges, as we look at this subject and we look at, look at the examples that are placed before us, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and to show us that, that we need to understand for this time. Shall we seek him now? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities we have to join together, to open your word, to observe and to seek to learn from the symbols and the examples that are placed within the book of Judges. Father, we have great need of you. We have great need of your spirit. We have great need of your angels. May your angels attend each one of us. May your spirit direct us. May we learn that which we need. May we be able to discern the symbols that are placed before us. so that we may more clearly understand the path that will be before us and may be prepared to receive your character as we continue to learn, as we continue to walk in these paths. I thank you for each one that are joining today We ask now for your guidance and direction. May your will be done. May we come to understand that which you would show us. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Now. Yesterday, we came to the end of Judges chapter 7. Now, we open Judges chapter 8. <clears throat> the overview that was provided by the translators in the 1769 Oxford Revised King James is as follows. In the first verse, the Ephraimites are offended with Gideon and he pacifieth them. The men of Sukkoth and of Penuel insolently refused relief to Gideon's army. Zeba and Zalmunna are taken prisoners. Sukkoth and Penuel are chastised. Gideon revenges the death of his brethren on Zeba and Zalmunna. He refuses the government which the people offer him, but asketh for the earrings of their prey, whereof he makes an ephod, which becomes a cause of idolatry. Midian is totally subdued, and we are shown Gideon's children, his death, his subsequent, the subsequent idolatry and the ingratitude of the Israelites. <clears throat> now, in verse one, <clears throat> and the men of Ephraim said unto him, why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him, sharply. The alternate reading is asking, what thing is this thou hast done unto us? And instead of chiding with him sharply, they chided with him strongly. Verse 
why would Ephraim at this point be upset given what had occurred and the call that had gone to them to stop the retreat of the enemy? Well, I mean, he does call Ephraim later. True. And um, so, but if, you know, if you take it, why has they done this, done, hast thou done unto us? What is this thing thou hast done unto us? Um, I mean, it would sort of be a, I don't know, I can't think of the word, a re rebuffed or whatever. I mean, it, it's just, they're not respected. It's like, you didn't, you didn't call us to come and help you. Why not? Um, why did you have to wait till later? Um, and of course, then you're going to call us later. You know, why didn't you just call us at the beginning? Um, so I'm not really sure. Um, you know, the, I mean, he doesn't really give a reason. But, but somehow they become offended because of it. Now, you know, part of the thing that we're dealing with here is we have these lines. So we know the Sunday law is that battle against the Midianites. Um, so where do we put this history? How do we place this within a line? I mean, that's the first thing I would ask. Well, I would, I would be asking the question as to which Sunday law are we referring to? Well, the Sunday law that Jeff has always referred to, 9-11, Midnight, Midnight Cry, Sunday law. So that's, that's how we've always looked at what happened with Gideon. Now, we could have a repeat and enlarge in the rest of the story. So, I mean, that's one of the things we have to sort out when it comes to understanding these lines, because we understand, you know, on the big line, Ellen White has this Sunday law. And and we had originally understood that, that that was the next thing. That would be Revelation 18. But now we have 9-11 as Revelation 18. We have this zoom in to the Sunday law. And um, so, you know, we have to sort out how we do this. And just like the other stories, we tended to have um, things being repeated in some way so that we can see that there's more than one line here. There is, you know, there's a number of things going on. Okay, so my, my question from here is this. We are aware that there is a Sunday law that when it occurs is going to be coupled with the decree of death. Yeah, but that's after the close of probation. So that's not really, that's not the Sunday law being talked about when we have church and state combined. That's not the image of the beast. That's just a later Sunday law. That is the final Sunday law, right? Right. That's the final Sunday law. But the one that Ellen White talks about is the Sunday law in the United States. That's the one that we we understand that church and state combine, that the, the Republican horn falls, um, the repudiation of the Constitution, all those types of things. That's what we generally as Adventists talk about as the Sunday law. We know that there's going to be a progression uh, that happens after that Sunday law. It's going to become more intensified up to the point where there's going to be a death decree. But that death decree is is after the close of probation. It's not before the close of probation. I guess what I'm getting at is that the one that is after the close of probation, mm -hmm. the final Sunday law, yeah. would also allow then for a initial or repeat of a Sunday law. So it becomes part of a multi-step process is what I'm trying to get at. 
Yeah, I, I understand that. It's just that when it comes to how we've always looked at the lines, we've never really discussed that death decree Sunday law as part of our line. That is, we have the Sunday law, then we have the loud cry, then we have the close of probation, and then we have all those the plagues and the Sunday law and all those things, which in a, them, themselves have a line. But the focus has always been upon the first Sunday law. Now, in this history, then, you, you, I mean, we're not talking about something that's happening after the close of probation. At least I don't think so here. I think it's going to repeat. It's going to give another illustration of the history that it already gave. It's a repeat and enlarge, as far as I can see. It may well be. It's just that there's there's some benefit to clarifying mm -hmm. the initial versus the final. Mm -hmm. Because if as I'm having to look at this. At the outset of Christ ministry, it was coming to a point where the leaders at that time were getting very frustrated with him because of the message that he was given. And so from the from some of the earliest portions of his ministry, they sought to do away with him. But that didn't happen until we come almost to the close of his ministry and then they're seeking his death. So in the life of Christ, we have what could be shown as being elements of a Sunday law. Well, the Sunday law is the cross in our lines. Right. Yeah. I'm not... On, on that part, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying from the earliest part of his ministry all the way down, we have elements that we can also apply to what's happening with the Sunday law. So in this, we have Ephraim, the, the men of Ephraim, Coming to Gideon, their brother from Manasseh. Why have we not been called? Why have you not allowed us to join in your ministry? And he said unto them, what have I done now in comparison to you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of a Bezer? What is this vintage that he is speaking of? I mean, we're talking grapes. We're talking doctrine. What is he, what is he saying to the men of Ephraim? Well, I mean, here, this is going to be, I mean, what he's trying to compare it to is the fact that they uh, killed the two princes, and so that their victory was even greater than theirs, than Gideon's. Um, okay. I mean, that's that's what he's referring to, why he uses this illustration. I mean, it's the idea is that it's not, he's taking this challenge and he's softening it by basically being grateful for what they have done. Okay. Well, Abizer, 
my father is help. Yeah. Or so the that, help of my father. Yeah, so that's his family, Gideon's family. So he's saying the least portion, <clears throat> the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim are better than the entire vintage of my family. Yeah, because Ephraim is larger. It's, you know, so he's he's putting down himself. He's being humble in this context. Self-deprecating. Yeah. So... Is this an example of a group that's frustrated with Gideon, with those at the end of, of time, and saying that you've done more work than what we have done? I mean, I'm, I struggle a little bit with this. Well, I, I would think that, that that would definitely illustrate what's what has been happening. I mean, in a sense, there's a type of jealousy, but but Gideon isn't isn't proud. I mean, he's not looking at this as something that he accomplished. This is something that God has accomplished. Okay. So he's he's not really taking credit for it. Who would Ephraim represent? Does Ephraim represent the movement? Well, the way that we're making this application is the movement. So it represents something within the movement. So then would that which brings the death of the princes of Midian, of, of Midian mm -hmm. is that a representation of something that is yet to occur? Because we're, we were applying the battle itself as being symbolically like this of July 18th. Right. But we don't have to necessarily follow this story chronologically after that. Okay. No, even though the story does, we can look back that it can it can represent a repeat and enlarge. But but even if you were to take it after, so July 18th has passed. Now, the, the type of the Sunday law that we have, of course, is the pandemic. So so our movement doesn't have a Sunday law per se. It doesn't have it, it exists before the Sunday law in the United States. But we do have a type of the Sunday law, and so we could apply it in that sense. But I, I would think that there is, is light that comes from everywhere in the movement. And so, I mean, this could be something that unfolds as time goes on. Okay. But, you know, there's a call made to Ephraim. And they're going to come and they're going to defend the fords. And, and the question is, has that happened yet? Right? Within the movement. I don't see it having have happened. Okay. So you would still think it's going to be future. Well, I mean, what, what I'm seeing here is Ephraim wanting to know why they weren't invited to join the battle. So is Ephraim seeking unity with Gideon and his band? I don't think so, but okay. I, could be wrong. I think it's just that they felt left out. But I think Gideon is seeking unity. Okay. 
does it matter which side then is seeking unity as long as unity is is looked to be achieved yeah it doesn't matter it's just that gideon is going to act in such a way that is going to bring about unity instead of responding in kind So you would say that in this, that Gideon is, is giving the men of Ephraim a soft answer. Yep. Okay. Now it's interesting for me, as we're looking at these, at these first couple of verses. Mm -hmm. That we have another example that we'll soon address coming from Judges 12. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, <clears throat> Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon and did not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. Why would they look upon themselves as being ignored by Gideon and then later by Jephthah? Well, you mean earlier. Oh, oh this is later. Never mind. Yeah, this is going to be later. Right, because this is going to be in the story of... Um, Yeah, okay, never mind. Yeah, so this is going to be the story of Jephthah, okay, which is later. Which, so, um, which is a type of repeat, isn't it? <clears throat> well, all of these are going to be repeat. So, so that's going to give us more detail. Each of these, um, yeah, I never changed. Okay. Yeah, so that's going to be the Ammonites. So this is going to be again over on the west, west of or east of the Jordan. I just find it interesting that in Judges twelve, they would be going north. So they're they're going to be fighting against an enemy that's coming from the north. And as we have as we have looked at others before, this has elements of the king of the north. Mm -hmm. yeah, the so other... we're, yeah, so we're going to have this history repeated again. So Ephraim again is going to be upset about not being invited. And then, of course, first or second Samuel nineteen forty one. And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king and said unto the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen thee away and have brought the king and his household and all David's men with him over Jordan? So there seem to be a lot of feelings with the different tribes that they're being ignored, that they're not being allowed to participate, that they're not being taken into confidence with different situations that are happening. In a manner of speaking, these are some very jealous brothers. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of reminded of the time when uh, Ephraim came to Joshua and wanted more land. Right. And then he said, no, we, we deserve more land. We were a bigger tribe. And then uh, he said, well, go and get some, whatever. But he said, they said there's going to be giants there. So, you know, we're, and they, they, they said it kind of contradicted themselves. He said they were a great people. Well, Joshua said, well, if you're a great people, go and get the land. Right. So they didn't seem to be too interested 
and fighting them and standing up and being part of the battle at that their time. But they seem to have, uh, when someone else is winning and doing something, they want to be part of it. But when it's just down to themselves to do the battle, they're not really interested. So, so how would you make an application to now then, Stephen? Well, it's kind of it's illustrating of people that they want to be part of the glory. Mm -hmm. There's something happening. They want to be. They want to be there, but they're not willing in themselves to make the effort. Mm -hmm. um, they're happy with someone else there to lead. So, if there's people there, we could maybe apply that to. That would maybe um, be applicable. To to apply it to what? Well, I'm just saying. There's uh, maybe there could be uh, people we could apply that to. But I'm not uh, suggesting, I haven't really thought about who, who who would sort of sit that. Yeah. Well, I do know within this movement, there is that type of, that type of jealousy has existed in, in all the time I've been in the movement. And, you know, we saw, um, you know, we saw in some people, you know, for instance, when Colin came up with the idea of, the 19th Republican president and then the 20th uh, Adventist president. Um, you know, we had Tabo, for instance, who was uh, opposed to that because he didn't come up with it, but then he went around promoting it, right? He, he took the glory of that, things, blessings uh, had done. He wanted to have the glory as if it was something he had come up with. There was all kinds of jealousies going on between different people, rumor and gossip, undermining, talking behind the back, because uh, people were being competitive. And, and, you know, and that type of thing has existed in the movement. And it's the one thing that I think has hindered the movement more than anything else. It's not so much that we, under, you know, that we don't understand some truth or that we don't agree um, you know, on certain things. It's that there's this competitive spirit that goes on. People are, in a sense, vying for territory, for glory or something. I'm not sure what it is. But the answer to that is this, um, this message that if we're going to take it to heart, um, it has to do a work of reformation in the life. It's not just about knowing certain things. And when it comes to when it comes to the problems that exist in the movement, we can't look any farther than ourselves. It, it doesn't help to you know to point out the problems with someone else. So I mean, some of these this exact same type of thing that we see here from Ephraim, I've experienced personally. And, and I, I just try to give a soft answer, but I can't change anyone else. And, and I would think that other people in the movement have brought light. So, you know, when it comes to whatever de uh, defeating the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb would mean, I mean, that's something that, has to happen whether it's I, I don't think it has happened i would agree with dwight but the wolf is still there and the raven is still there well <clears throat> we've got we've got some further things that are going to be occurring in this chapter especially as we look further at, at what's going on with the the children of ephraim God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, or of Benzeb. And what was I able to do in comparison 
of you. Then their anger or their spirit was abated toward him when he had said that. Mm -hmm. Now, as we went over before, Oreb, meaning raven. There are others that would say that Oreb is sunset or evening. And I put the, the reference where I'm obtaining that mm -hmm. in, the, in the list. Yeah, now the, 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 way, the way that it gets evening, uh, yes. Adab is evening. So so that's where they would get it. You know, Adab, Boker. Right. Evening and morning, right. So it gives us a, a potential tie-in with the 2300 days. And I say potential because there's a lot here to be considered. So with what Stephen was referring to, would that would that be something we'd need to look at Joshua 17, 14 to 18? I don't think we need to look at it. Okay. Not right now, anyway. Okay. Now, here again. Here's Zeb. Despise, frighten, drive away, or wolf. Now, we're accepting Raven and the wolf. The point now is well taken. Because if this is Arab, then we have a part of what's being referred to in the message of the 2300 days. But it's also showing if, if we're going to accept that as being evening, then we have the portion as, as we've addressed it, evening and morning being the X day. Okay, so one of the things about um, evening and morning that's not, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, at least. Um, I mean, I have mentioned about sunset being April 19th. Right. And that's because Samuel Snow, he's at midnight, right? He's making this argument why he's at midnight. And that's based upon that sunset is April 19th. And that means morning is the 10th day of the seventh month. And when, when it comes to the 2300 days, you know, one of the questions, why is it presented 2300 evenings and mornings? You know, not just 2300 days. And of course, one is it is tied to sanctuary language, the evening and the morning sacrifice. But more likely, uh, it goes back to creation. The evening and the morning were one day, the evening and morning were two days. Right. Okay. Agreed. And, but we can also see that there is within the year an evening and a morning. Right. Right. That is the year is divided into two parts uh, with the spring equinox and the autumnal equinox. And that's also the spring types and the fall types. And so those both come into play in understanding the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. So, so the idea, though, here that this then is sunset, um, because that's why it's called a raven, because it's, it's like it's dusky color, right? So it's like dusk. Um, so, so we can see there that this then would refer to um, the messages given in 18... Uh, 43 and 1844 with this idea of sunset. So, so it ties to the spring types. Now, now Zeb itself being a wolf, despise, fright, and drive away. I, I don't know how I would tie that to, to uh, the fall types, but um, we can see in these two different symbols, we can see the two aspects of the message, right? Um, 
or of the enemy, I guess I should say. So you have the wolf that, that comes in and destroys the flock, but you have the raven that's, that's a, a scavenger. And it would be like the, the sort of gossip and rumors, you know, having your friends for lunch, so to speak. Um, you know, the cannibalism that Ellen White talks about. So, so this is this is the enemy that needs to be defeated, and it's going to be defeated by Ephraim, not by Gideon. So, as we look at this, when we are referencing this with the Sunday Law, is there an evening and a morning in reference to the Sunday law? As you as you have just applied some of this. I don't I don't see that, but maybe there's something I don't see, but okay. Now one of the other things to look at in reference to this would be Psalms 83. Now, when you go through this portion, you have a song or psalm of Asaph. Keep not Thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and have consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no more be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagarines, Gabel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them, they have holpen the children of Lot, Salah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kishon, which perished at Endor, they became as the dung of the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, or like their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, Yea, all their princes as Zeba and as Zalmunna, who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind. As the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thine, thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them put to shame, let them be put to shame and to perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, and the Most High over the earth. In this psalm, Oreb and Zeb and Zeba and Zalmunna are all being referenced, along with Sisera, along with Jabin, along with many others that had come up against the children of Israel. So there's, there's a lot to these symbols that we're looking at. 
And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. Now, according to this, the name of Zeba would be victim or sacrifice. Zalmunna, the shadow is withheld. Is there anything other than this that we would have as far as a meaning for the names of these kings of Midian? And why is it important that Gideon allowed the Ephraimites to slay Oreb and Zeb, the princes of Midian, and Gideon is going after the kings of Midian. What do we see here? Any thoughts, any comments? Well, it's, it's matching rank with rank. As the head of the army, he would take out the head, heads of the opposing army, in a sense. Okay. Why is Gideon coming to the men of Sukkoth? Which if, if we understand this correctly, would be booths in the feminine. I mean, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles was always to be the last feast of the Jewish economy. And that's when all of the grapes are crushed. The vintage is now set aside. The grain is brought in. As we know from the opening of, of, the, of the chapters that we've been studying, Gideon had been hiding to be able to thresh his grain because the kings, the, the Midianites would not look for him at the wine press because it wasn't time for the wine. So Gideon has come on to Sukkoth. He's come on to the booths that are being expressed in the feminine. What can we, what can we see from this type, from this example? Well, booths are feminine. In, mm -hmm. all, in all cases? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is he seeking bread then from these booths from the men of the booths literally okay he's hungry but what does the bread represent what does it represent for us today well it represents the word of god and sukkoth could represent the fall types the second coming Maybe it could it be the boots? Excuse me. Could it be the boots? Could be like churches or groups of folks who are churches, if they're seeking God, if they want to surrender to Him, who are going to come in just before Christ returns, come and do the truth. So I come join us.
It reminds me of Meroz, those who don't come up for the help of the Lord. Right. As we're going to see, the men of Sukkoth, the men of the booths, do not respond well to Gideon's request. Perhaps the heads of them don't, but what about the few that will? Like the heads of the churches, for example, right now, who are suppressing the truth. They're keeping back the truth from their members, and there will always be a few that won't buy that, like myself. And we okay. come in late. Like I didn't come into the movement until 2015. 2014, I knew that something existed. 2015, I was invited to my first camp meeting. Didn't even know FFA existed until then. So in Judges 8, 6, and the princes of Sukkoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand that we should give bread unto thine army? As a comparison, we are recommended to see 1 Kings 20, verse 11. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself that he putteth it off. And then we also have 1 Samuel 25, 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? Here again, we have the example of Nabal. So are the translators looking at this that the men of Sukkoth are prefiguring Nabal? Well, they're just paralleling similar stories. I don't think they think of it as prefiguring. Okay. But uh, Ellen White says regarding this, so she talks about what happens with Gideon. Um, and um, so this is in Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay. So she says, as news of the victory spread, thousands of men of Israel who had been dismissed to their homes returned and joined in pursuit of their fleeing enemies. The Midianites were making their way toward the Jordan, hoping to reach their own territory beyond the river. Gideon sent messengers to the tribe of Ephraim, rousing them to intercept the fugitives at the southern fords. Meanwhile, with 300 yet faint, faint yet pursuing, Gideon crossed the stream hard after those who had already gained the farther side. The two princes, Zeba and Zalmunna, who had been over the entire host and who had escaped with an army of 15,000 men, were overtaken by Gideon, their force completely scattered, and the leaders captured and slain. Um, in this signal defeat, not less than 120,000 of the invaders perished. Etc. Um, it's interesting she calls them two princes, not kings. Not sure particularly why, but. Okay. Yeah, that is interesting as to why she is not calling them kings. Mm hmm. In this situation, the princes or the leaders of Sukkoth are basically saying, have you captured Zeba and Zalmunna? That we should now give you sustenance, that we should now reward you, or that we should now feed you?
Yeah, Ellen White makes no reference to the men of Sukkoth that I could find. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so these people, they're just saying you haven't had a victory yet. Why should we feed you? Right. So I, I would still think that this relates more to um, the church not offering support to this message. So is this the church not offering support regarding July 18th, or is this the church not offering support regarding the Sunday law? I would think the Sunday law. Okay. All right. And Gideon said, therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will thresh your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. I'm going to come back and I'm going to whip you with the thorns of the wilderness. I'm going to come back and teach you a lesson. So Gideon is being very direct. Choose to help us now or pay the penalty later. Yeah. Now, we're going to have the same situation with the men of Penuel. Right. But we need to look at this first example before we go on to the next. Because we're going to have to develop or consider carefully who the men of Penuel are going to represent in this case. And he went up hence to Penuel and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered him. What does Penuel represent? What kind of a symbol can we derive from this? Well, it means the face of God. Okay. And that's going to be the place where... Um, Um, I mean, we're going to have Jacob is there at Penuel. Um, is that the first time it's mentioned? Genesis 32. And that's going to be, yeah, that's where he wrestles with the angel. Um, so all of these all of these of the children of Israel would have been very familiar with the symbol of Penuel because here is where Jacob was wrestling with Christ yeah what happens to us when we wrestle with Christ If it's done with the right intention, we we benefit and Christ benefits. Like if we're wrestling with Christ to help us overcome a certain sin in our life or if we're begging him to intervene, if somebody, if in my case, a loved one was threatening suicide and other attacks that have happened to me and my family, it's just amazing that experience. I mean, we all need to have it. I mean, this could also refer to the time of trouble, right? When 
when the death de 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 decree is passed and we're imploring God, <clears throat> hoping that all our sins have been totally removed. All right. <clears throat> So <clears throat> Gideon is now rebuffed twice. Where is Sukkoth and where is Penuel? Under what tribe would we say this, this exists? Because we do, we do see that what Gideon says next, and he spake also unto the men of Penuel, saying, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. So are Sukkoth and Penuel on the east side of the Jordan or on the west? They're on the east. So that means that they're either in the, in, in the territory of Manasseh, of Reuben, or of Gad. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm pretty sure it's Manasseh. because of where they're located, but. Uh... Okay, no, Penuel in, and Sokoth um, are both in Gad. So they're just, just along that, at least on this one map, along the southern border of Manasseh. Yeah, so yeah, I know we had looked in this into this before. Yeah, because you have uh, the Jabbok uh, flowing down into the Jordan, and Mahanaim is uh, just north of Penuel, right? So this is the brook Jabbok where Jacob is, and, and so these are actually in the tribe of Gad, but not very far from, from the tribe of Manasseh. And that's just because the Gad here on this map, it kind of goes up along uh, the eastern bank of the Jordan. They have that territory. Okay. Even though they're mostly down by, because uh, Reuben's east of the Salt Sea, and Gad is just north of the Salt Sea, about halfway up the length of the Jordan. But they have a strip going all, at least on this map, all the way up to... Uh, to the Sea of Galilee. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. Why is it important that he would break down their tower? Why is he saying to the face of God, I will break down this tower. What is the tower representing? Well, a structure. Literally, yes. But what, what do we see of the tower as a symbol? Well, I mean, it can be a watchtower. It could be symbolize a church. All right. I'm looking up something very quickly. Hmm. 
Could the tower be pride? That would be an interesting application. That'd be something to think about. Yes, it makes, it makes sense in that uh, when you're in a tower, you're able to survey everything around you. And it's like you're, you're monitoring those below you. And isn't that what the uh, Sanhedrin, shall we say, in the mainstream churches do? And I'm not just talking about SDA. Well, you've got, when you're in a tower, you also have a, you have a clear vision of everything going on around, like you just said. But it's very panoramic. Right. Would we say On that? Isaiah, sorry, right in Isaiah 30, 25, it talks about uh, streams of water in the days that the towers fall. And I always thought that was talking about the World Trade Center, but it's more than that. I mean, God wants to cast down every high thing that exalts itself against his power. And he cannot do that within us unless we let him. And it's a painful process, but that's the way we enter heaven, by dying to self. And God alone knows I and a lot of other people have way too much pride. But in this, in this situation with this tower, would this also, as, as Elder Jeff has pointed out in the past, could this be another representation of the calzone vision, the panoramic vision. Oh, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, we've accepted, you know, the calzone and the other visions very specifically, but many within, not just not just within the corporate church, but within churches in general, do not accept that. So the men of Penuel, could they have been benefited by the Calzone vision? And is it, I mean, is this something that, that he's saying that I'm, I'm not going to allow your opinion, your vision to continue? Judges 8.10. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Krakor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men. And all that were left of, all the hosts of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. Here we have a symbol of 15,000 and we have a symbol of 120,000. What do these symbols say to us? What, what meaning do we derive from this? What have we said before about 120? What does it relate to? Time of probation between uh, when the ark was building. Right. Now what about 15? There is the 15 fathoms in, in Acts 27. But um, I just have another question here, because uh, sure. we're looking at this verse that was referenced by um, 
Angela there, Isaiah 30, verse 25. Okay. Where it talks about when the towers fall. And there shall be upon every high mountain, upon every high hill, rivers and streams and waters in the day of great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. And, I mean, this may seem a little bit unrelated, uh, but Stephen had noted that um, if we took the verses in Leviticus 26 that have the word seven times, which is or 16, 23, 25, and 32, and you multiply them together, you get uh, 294,000, which is 2,300 sevenfold. That is, if you take 2,300 and you, you double it, and then you double it again and you double it, and you do that seven times, then you get this number, 294,000. And I never really thought of a fold as a doubling for some reason, a little bit slow, I guess. But is any, does anybody know how many times you can pull to fold a piece of paper? Normally it's by seven, seven times. Okay, seven times. So that's kind of, uh, I, I can only do it six times, but I mean, you could sort of get seven out of there. And it just ends up a wad. But I wonder if that somehow relates. I know it's, yeah, it's just it was it was the seven times in Daniel chapter four. Not the Leviticus twenty six. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Daniel chapter four. Pardon me. Yeah. Yeah, because those aren't the same verses. So in Daniel chapter four. Um, but anyway, you have this sevenfold, right? All right. Um, so I'm just saying that there's something here uh, that the dealing with this tower and the seven times. The tower doesn't refer to 9-11, not to the Twin Towers, but anyway. Well, okay, I'm, I'm going to throw something at you from, from this reference. When you read this verse, when you read Isaiah 30, 26, you are given this that says, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Right? Mm -hmm. Now. The word that is being translated here as moon is not the common word used thereof. Several years ago on a Sabbath study, I asked a question. There was myself and there were two sisters that were at this study. One I am yet friends with. One has made it very clear that she does not believe that I've understood the third angel's message whatsoever and therefore required that I no longer worship with her or in her house. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this at you all. This verse, this, this translation of the moon is more properly translated as the white.
I would like you to compare Isaiah 30, 26, as we've just done here, with Isaiah 24, 23. To read that, then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. When we look at this in comparison with Isaiah 30, 26, moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. Are we not referencing here, or can we not see the symbol here, that this light of the moon, this so-called lesser light, is giving us a symbol of the writings of Sister White, and that the light of the sun, not speaking of the orb in the sky, but the son of God shall be as sevenfold or seven times as the light of seven days, the light of seven yom, the hot, in the day that the Lord bindeth the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Well, here, here in Isaiah 24, it, it's actually doing the opposite, as you see in Isaiah 30. 30. So in Isaiah 30, you see uh, these things brightened. Here you see them diminished. So the moon is blushed, and the sun is um, um, dimmed. It's turned pale, is the idea there. So you have these kind of opposite things happening in these chapters. But as far as the spirit of prophecy, we've always understood that the moon represents the spirit of prophecy, no matter which word moon is used. But in this, I just, I found it intriguing because only three times mm -hmm. is this word used within scripture. And each time the white is being translated as the moon. Right. So using roughly five verses with these two from Isaiah being very key. I use that as my support to this with the validity of Mrs. White as a prophet. As I stated earlier, I mean, I've, I've had a difficult time this week. I had a dear friend make a comment that they felt that I was on the wrong path in placing the writings of the spirit of prophecy as those of a prophet that we would find within the Bible. I've had too many friends that as they have done their deep dive into the spirit of prophecy have decided that certain points that Mrs. White brings out very clearly need to be that these points should be set aside because they disagreed with some very deeply held conviction on their part yeah and that's usually how it is people reject the spirit of prophecy because they have some cherished opinion that ellen white then uh counteracts right and and so, they can sometimes really small points like hugely almost, small yeah yeah, huge. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I realize that that's, that's kind of a difficult concept for something to be hugely small. But in my world, when I look at a term that I see all the time in, in restaurants called jumbo shrimp, I mean, it's I always like, have. It's an oxymoron. Yes, very much. Very much. But, so, but, but the point is here is that that we have to be able to submit to the counsel of the Holy Spirit, which includes all of the prophets. We can't just 
reject the Bible or the spirit of prophecy or some part of the Bible or some part of the spirit of prophecy because we have some cherished view that is contradicted by it. Right. You know, I experienced this early on in my 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 Adventist life where I, I had done the study and come to a conclusion and in reading the spirit of prophecy found that I was wrong. And um you know, it was just sometimes we can be wrong. So, but it was it was a hard one. It was the first one for me, and so I have to I had to submit to the spirit of prophecy. And then later I found reasons why she held that position. But if I just held to my position and rejected Ellen White merely because I had some opinion, um, that's definitely not a very good reason to reject. Uh -huh. Well, at this point, I thank you each for this for this little time of going into these other verses in Isaiah with all in comparison with what we're seeing here with judges. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit uh, off track, but in some ways it's not. Um, because I think what we're looking at here with these these different groups, Sukkoth and Penuel, however we want to, I mean, I don't know if I can fully understand exactly what they represent, you know, if, you know, in a very specific way, but they do represent symbols that we already understand, Sukkoth being the second advent and Penuel, the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. And and these would represent within Adventism some groups that either are looking for the second coming of Christ or maybe, uh, you know, at least they're they're seeking, they're representing that, but they're actually rejecting a message. They're not going to support a message that needs to be given. So, you know, if I was going to just, you know, make a guess, which I don't usually like to do, but I could say that Sukkoth represents the organized Adventist church and Penuel represents independent ministries, but that would just be a guess. But maybe something like that. What if you reverse that? Reverse it? Yeah. I don't know why I would reverse it. What would be <clears throat> the reversing it? Well, what I'm saying is, what if Penuel is the organized church and Sukkoth is the independent ministries? Yeah. But for what reason? I just want to know the reason. I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at the tower as being the structure. Okay. Yeah, which I would say too. So that would be the reason. Okay. Right. I mean, I, I think that your example is valid. Yeah, independent ministries have a structure as well. But are we are we as cognizant of their structure as we are of that of the corporate church? Well, we're not generally, I would don't think. We would look at the structure as being the corporate church. But, you know, the tower being destroyed for the independent ministries who are supporting the church. I mean, they're, they're independent. Maybe we could call them dependent ministries. Yeah. <laughs> you That's know, true. because when the tower is destroyed, a lot of these groups, the problem that they face is that even though they are, they're independent from the church in some ways, they're also dependent upon the church. That is, they're not, they're not they have this belief that the church is still going to go through most of the independent ministries, especially what we would call the supporting ones, you know, the amazing facts and, and um, um, all the other ones. I can't think of all the names of them. Uh, Walter Weiss ministry, amazing discoveries and, uh, and Ty Gibson's ministry. And, you know, there's probably dozens and dozens and dozens of right. ministries in this way that you know they're they're still 
behind the church in a certain sense. And and they seek to, you know, to speak in the Adventist churches and so forth. And 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 most Adventists who are regular Adventists are going to be, you know, not most, but lots of them are going to be people who um, are still Adventists who watch them. Right. So you're not going to have, uh, you know, people watching Doug Batchelor who who aren't um, Adventists. Right. It's going to mostly be Adventists, if that makes sense. So maybe the destruction of that tower is something that that the independent ministries are dependent upon. And that's why it's in reference to them, because the reason I use Succoth, because it represents uh, the booths or the building. It also represents the structure. But it also represents the second coming. And Penuel is those that are um, the ones who see the face of God. Right? So those are the ones who believe in righteousness by faith and all these, these truths. They're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble, Christ's character being re perfectly reproduced in his people. And yet they can't see that they need to support a message that Gideon is giving. Exactly. Okay. They don't wish to provide the sustenance to the work that Gideon is doing. Mm -hmm. And and some of those and some of those people are within our, the movement ourself, who are still, I think, represented by Penuel. Okay. Would you say it's pride that stops them from seeing what? Okay. Well, that's a good question. So, I mean, obviously it would have to be, but I mean, it's a little more complex than that. I mean, one of the things that, that I've noticed is that we have... When you have a righteous person who represents the truth, and then you have people who are somehow condemned by that person's actions, it doesn't mean the person is condemning them, but his actions condemn them, that they will often attack that person. And, and sometimes it can be, you know, jealousy. I mean, there can be all different kinds of uh, motives. But, you know, I mean, it must come down to pride. I mean, why would we not support the message just because somebody's not understanding something the way that we understand it? You know, we would have to support things. I mean, we look at what Odilio is doing and what Colin has been doing and even Daniel Fontenot and others. People are presenting a message. And it doesn't make sense for anybody to condemn them uh, for their message, even if there are some things we don't agree with in that message. Because overall, we can see they're still part of the movement. They're not, the message is not contrary to the truth, it's just not complete. So, but often what happens is people will. You know, you need to present the message the way that I present it. And I don't think that that's the case. I think God is using all different kinds of people, even people who we wouldn't even consider in this movement. He's giving them light. And there shouldn't be this infighting. There shouldn't be this jealousy that we saw in the disciples, even when other people were baptizing, uh, you know, the disciples, you know, why why are those these people uh, presenting a different message than us? And Jesus didn't support them in their criticism. So, I mean, it's human nature, whatever it is. Is it 
human nature or is it the acceptance of the spirit of our adversary? Well, that would be human nature. Because ever since the lie was believed, man's nature has, has been affected. Right. Yeah, we need a new nature. We need to be converted. And that's only by the Spirit of God. You know, it, it's the funny thing is, it's even to the point where if you try to support someone, that they won't even accept support. Yeah. They're going to interpret anything you do to support them as some kind of agenda or being subvertive. I've had this happen many times in this movement and in the church. Because they, they assume the motives they have, they assume those motives upon others. Because if they were doing the same thing, they would be doing it for selfish motives. It gives us a lot to have to consider here in this example, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, with this little symbol, we are entering in, in Judges 8.10, we're entering into a new portion, a new portion of the subject within this book of Judges. We have just a few minutes remaining of our time for mm -hmm. today. Yeah, and we're going to have some time off for those who are watching the videos not live um, because we're going to pick this up again uh, on the 31st right. of July. So, so we got 10 days off. Consider the examples that we have, have been addressing. Let's consider some of these other symbols. We have a lot really that we have to think about because as we're looking at this, we're seeing a message. We're seeing a message that is to go out. We're seeing some that may have heard portions of this message, but like the men of Ephraim, like the men of Penuel, like the men of Sukkoth, they're setting aside this message. Now, Ephraim came <clears throat> with the question of, why haven't you let me participate? Mm -hmm. Sukkoth and Penuel are exactly the opposite. We need, your, we need some sustenance. We need some assistance. Well, you, don't, you, you haven't proved anything to us, so why would we share with you? So there's a lot we have to look at and a lot for us here to consider. Mm -hmm. And when we take this back up, we have a lot that we're going to have to look at. Because the balance of this chapter has major points for us at this time. Now, do we have any other thoughts or comments on what we have addressed today? I think it sounds like July 18th. <laughs> it may well be. What's the meaning of 15th, all done? I, I'm sorry, you didn't come through clearly. What's the meaning of 15,000? 15,000? We no. don't. Okay, we've, we didn't delve into that, did we? No. So we have more to consider here. 
I mean, I when we were when I was looking at this, the symbol of 15 is going to be kind of interesting. Oh, because, uh, and stay of the fifth month, maybe. Well, <clears throat> I was looking at it when when we consider the 15th day of the first month, especially in the life of Christ. We wind up coming to the day after the crucifixion. We have a lot to look at here. So let's all take time Let's put our notes together and then be able to put our heads together when we reassemble. And let's address this point by point. For there is much here yet for us to see. There is much here yet for us to glean. There is much precious food for us yet to take in. Any other comments? Yeah, just what Angela said. The first day of the fifth month. Okay. Connecting out with the fifth, connecting out with the fifteenth, but also connect with the one hundred and twenty thousand. And now that's one hundred and twenty days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the, of the fifth month. Mm -hmm. So maybe a midnight cry connection there as well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you each for your participation today. Shall we now close with prayer? Yeah, just a request there, Dwight. So, sure. um, you know, we're going to be gone backpacking for five days. And so we're definitely going to need um, God's help. Um, you know, going through this journey. Right. But the main thing is it's to have time in nature, isolated, you know, without electronic devices and just being able to think and pray. So. So anyway, if you can pray for us. Okay. Well. All right. Shall we then close this meeting? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to meet together. There are many things that are, are yet to be seen, many things that we have yet to examine and examine carefully within this example. Father, we thank you for this time together, but we thank you also for this break that is coming up. We need your guidance. We need your direction. Please help us now as we are separated one from another. Protect those that are going backpacking. Guide us each one in our studies, in all that you would have us to do. Help us now that our minds might be open to that which you would have us to understand. Direct us so that when we assemble again, we may be prepared to participate, to present other aspects of this that we are seeing so that they may be carefully considered. Be with us each one. Help us so that we may be prepared to give a message to this world 
and to those that we care about. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.